thanks this day. Turn with me, if you would, to the prophetic book of Isaiah. And we're going to direct our attention to that ninth chapter. Amen. And we're going to read beginning at that sixth verse. Again, that is Isaiah, the ninth chapter. And we're going to begin reading at that sixth verse. And it reads, for a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders. And he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. God's word for God's people. Uh, let us look to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity, not only to rightly divide your word, but to feast thereof. For indeed, our desire this day and every day is to feed, O oh Lord, till we want no more. For indeed, when it comes to our wants, Lord, you have met every need and even supplied our wants. We stand knowing that as the righteous, our seed shall never be forsaken nor begging for bread. For indeed, you have been better than good. You have been God. God in our homes, God on our jobs, God in our schools, God in our coming and God in our going. And it is for that reason that we do declare that we are blessed. Not by our own might or merit, but by the relationship afforded unto us by you. That you were mindful of us, that you thought enough of us, that you would come down through 42 generations, clothe yourself in humanity, and walk with us through our pains, through our trials, through our troubles, through our tribulations, through our problems. God, you know everything that we could endure. But more than that, Lord, you have offered us an interdwelling that you may have home and peace within us. So we thank you, God, for this day. And we thank you, God, for this opportunity. Simply say it, Lord, have thy way. Have thy way in this service. Have thy way in this sanctuary. Have thy way in this, your servant. Have your way in all the saints that have gathered here this day to hear word. And finally, have your way in the sermon. Yeah. That ultimately you will be glorified and we would be gainful. Yeah. Because of our hearing and receiving of that which you have already prepared for us. We pray, O oh Lord, that we be a prepared people. Getting ready for a prepared place. So keep us now, God, as only you can. Help us to remember the true reason for this season. For it isn't about gifts or, or big bellies that jiggle with jolly. But it is indeed about a sacrifice. Amen. A gift that keeps on giving. So now unto you who is able, Lord, we give thanks and honor, bless as only you can. It is in your righteous and perfect name that we do pray and let everyone that love the Lord say amen. 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 And amen. I want to preach from this morning. Uh, the topic is very simple, uh, but yet uh, it is uh, probably one of the, if not the most important topic that we must preach of. I want to preach from the, the subject and the title, Christ the King. 
Help me preach it. Tell your neighbor, Christ the King. Tell your other neighbor, Christ the King. As we look at this scripture and this prophetic book found in Isaiah, we see vivid pronouncement of a coming king. Uh, not just any king, but a kingdom. Um, for it talks about a wonderful counselor and a prince of peace and talks about an everlasting father. Uh, but not only just a king and kingdom, but God's king and God's kingdom. A kingdom that will be at not only rest, but also peace. It is ultimately a vision of God's glory and God's greatness being ushered in for all of creation. It is from crown to God's crowning glory to crowning glory of creation to all of creation that we see the spirit of God move and we stand in awe of its movement and its might. You know, uh, this vision and this profession prophetically that Isaiah offers, uh, it, is, it is vitally significant. Not simply because it paints a future picture, but more importantly because of the present reality uh, that the people of God were enduring. And that leads me to a point very early on in my preaching that I want you to lift up something that I don't want you to go home without. And it is advice for all who call on God and know that God is able. And I pray that all who hear me receive it. For it is true and it is scripturally sound that without a vision, the people will perish. Oftentimes when we think about vision, we think of something future in the far off. And that indeed what a vision is. But, but vision also speaks to your current circumstances. Vision, tell your neighbor vision. Vision is the embodiment of our faith and our hope. Vision is the focus of our faith. And it is the healing that is found in our hope. You see, if we look at the context in which this scripture is lifted out, uh, what once were the united descendants of Jacob now are divided into two kingdoms, Israel and Judah. And I know you've never had any division in your family. But you know, it is Christmas time. And outside of funerals, amen, and weddings, when we get together with our family during the holidays, old stuff, tell your neighbor old stuff. Old stuff has a way of making itself uh, known again. Old alts and old issues and old problems that family members used to have. And you think that if we were family, come on, preach thick pen. Well, maybe I'm just preaching about my family. You think that if we were family, if anybody ought be able to get over, if anybody ought be able to forgive, if anybody ought to be able to let go and move on, it ought be the people who claim they love you most. Preach, thick pen. But sometimes even families can become divided. Well, uh, Israel has divided itself from Judah and Judah has divided itself from Israel. And Israel is now facing the threat of invasion from the Assyrians and has appealed to their family. The kingdom of Judah to the south. And it was Ahaz, the king of Judah, who was being counseled by the prophet Isaiah not to trust in foreign aid or foreign gods, but to seek out God. Well, Ahaz refused. 
And not only did he refuse, but he invited the Assyrians to help him. The same ones that were seeking to invade his kinfolk. And I could preach, amen, about how sometimes, amen, family will side with the people, amen, that seem like they're out to do you the most harm, amen. But if I preach too further about that, y'all say I was meddling. Isaiah instructs Ahaz to ask for a sign from God. Ahaz refuses to ask for a sign for God. And, and Isaiah prophesies that whether you ask or not, God is going to give you a sign. Aren't you glad, amen, that even when we are disobedient to God, it does not change God's will for our life? That God is still going to be God. God is still going to do what God is going to do. I, I thank God for the many times that God pronounced things into my life and I was not ready to receive them nor willing to walk in obedience or faithfulness to God. But God, unlike me, was faithful and continued with God's plan for my life because I did not create myself nor sustain myself but it is God who knows all that is in store for my life so Ahaz as many of us have in our own life refused to do what God was instructing him to do but the prophet tells him that there will be a sign regardless and the sign that the prophet says will be a child Born for us, a son given to us, authority rests upon his shoulder, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually. And there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. You see, Isaiah, unsure of what the future would hold and having lost faith in Ahaz. But not faith in God. Amen. Isaiah envisions a future king. Christ the king. In the hope and belief that God will always. God will always. God will always save and deliver his people. But I don't want to go over that part too fast because. Notice here uh, that even though Isaiah was unsure of what the balance held, he was unsure of what the future would hold. He lost faith in Ahaz, but not in God. And I want to help somebody today, amen, that may be being mistreated by somebody that may have been done wrong, even by somebody you loved, even by a family member. I, I want to encourage somebody today that might be carrying some ought in their heart against somebody who's mistreated them that you can lose faith in them. But don't you ever. I wish I had some help. Don't you ever lose faith in God. Because even though you lose faith in them, guess who can change them? Come on, preach thick pen. You see, even though they may not do right, and even though they may not have gotten it right, if you hope in the one who can do exceedingly and abundantly above, if you hope in the one who can make a change in any life, even though they may in your mind be a lost cause, don't you ever, don't you ever lose hope in God. And I don't know who I'm preaching to this morning because of the way somebody else is treating you and has treated you. You're beginning to wonder, does God still love you? Amen. You're beginning to wonder, how could God let this happen to you? And even though the relationship with the person may be deteriorated, dead end and gone, don't ever let that transfer over or start to affect your relationship with God. 
Isaiah refusing to let his relationship with Ahaz affect his relationship with God. He professes a prophetic pronouncement. He says that a king is coming. You see, this hope for a coming king and for a future kingdom is further expounded on in that 11th chapter of Isaiah as the Holy Prophet brings the work of the Holy Spirit to the forefront. And you can take the time and turn there. I am too. Amen. Bless the Lord. For it is in that 11th chapter that it reads, a shoot shall come out from the stump of Jess. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest on him. And the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. Yeah, yeah. You see, the reason why I say it's the stump of Jesse, that, does anybody know what a stump is? That, that's something that has been cut off and cut down. Uh, believing to grow no more. Amen. Uh, it it seems as though that it's dead where it is. And ultimately in Isaiah's mind, he saw the situation that Judah was in as dead, that it couldn't grow no more, that literally because of their ability not to stand on the faith and stand for God that they weren't going to be able to stand any long period at all. And he believed, amen, that he needed in order to have hope for not only tomorrow, but ultimately the hope to survive today that he had to look to the future which he envisioned this king and this kingdom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's also a word to let us know that everything begins with the inner feeling of the spirit of the Lord. Amen. For when we look at this sevenfold divine endowment to the king, for that's what it was, seven things, six of them coupled in three pairs, that this same sevenfold divine endowment of the king, it is available by inheritance to all of God's people. Let me say it another way. What is spoken of, of Christ the King, is available for all of God's children. Yeah. Ephesians 1, 11 through 14 reads, In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, yeah. having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplished all things, according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, you were marked with a seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward the redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. Yeah, you see this sevenfold endowment that I will speak of shortly, uh, it really was given not only as the essence of the vision that Isaiah had for God's people to be saved, but more importantly to affirm the faithfulness of God's purpose and promises to God's people. You see the spirit of God in all of his glory is available to each and every one of us. It is a spirit of a living God that lives and moves within us that allows us to accomplish that which we did not believe or know that we could accomplish on our own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For when we accept Christ who is the king and allow him to have reign and sovereignty in our life and in our hearts, we then have access not only to accept the same things that are laid out in these first two scriptures but more importantly to accomplish not only that which Christ did but even more and I know I said a whole lot in a short amount of time but let me sum it up in three points that if you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior then you have access Access to the power of the spirit of the living God that moves and has its way because it is sovereign on this earth and then you can accomplish not only things that you thought you couldn't but the Bible says that you would accomplish even more than Christ did when he was here. 
And in case you still didn't get it, come on, tell your neighbor, accept. Then you have access. And then you can accomplish. You can accomplish whatever it is that you put your mind to. That's what Paul said when he said we can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives us strength. I am not a prescriber of what we can't do. As a matter of fact, you can't say Cain in my house. You can say either I need a little bit more time or I need a little bit more help. Because with enough time and enough help, those who believe in the Lord and call on his name can accomplish anything that they set their mind to. It's never been a question of God's ability. Come on, preach, thick pen. It's always been a question of our availability and willingness to believe and trust in God. And I don't know what you've been contemplating to do. I don't know what you made up your mind that you want to try to see if you can get it done. But you can't get nothing done without the moving of the spirit of the God within you. I'm trying to help, amen. I, I, I don't know who has told you you can't do it. I don't know who has said it is impossible. But if you believe in God, if you accept him as Lord and Savior, you have access to a power, to a strength. That's why it says he can do exceedingly and abundantly above what we can ask or even imagine. For when that power, that spirit that stirs within all of us moves, there's nothing we can't do. Matter of fact, don't tell me what I can't do. Because I know a God. I wish I had some people that would get with me right there. Amen. Because, because the problem is, and I'm trying to help. Amen. The problem is that many people are looking at you and trying to figure out what you can and can't do. But you can look at me all day because I'm not drawing on my power. I'm not drawing on my strength. I'm not drawing on my intelligence. I'm calling on the name, the one who is ancient of days, the one who is able to do anything but fail. So you can look at me and you might write the right assessment. I can't do it, but I know a man by the name. Come on, preach thick pen. I know a man by the name of Jesus. And my grandmama said that any time I need him, I can call on him. Hallelujah. Boy, if I could tell you all the time in my life where they said I wasn't deserving and I couldn't do it and it couldn't be done and I shouldn't even be there. But thanks be to God that there is a king named Christ. Yes, for it is in the scriptural consultation that Christ gives in the gospel of John that begins with these words. Let not your heart be troubled. And it is in that 14th chapter we says, let not your heart be troubled that Christ goes on to give assurances not only of a greater work that we will accomplish, but he designates the power through which we will accomplish it. For in 1412, he says, verily, verily, I tell you that one who believes in me will also do works that I do. In fact, will do greater works than those that I have because I have gone to the father. He also says in that same gospel, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And 14 and 26 read, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. I want you to just give your neighbor a simple encouragement. Tell them you can do it. I'll tell your other neighbor, you can do it. I don't know what you're trying to do. I don't know what you're working on, but I want you to know that you can do it. Tell them in the name of Jesus, you can do it. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can do it. Because God is able. <laughs> you, can, you can do it. Uh, let, let, let me hurry up and lay out this formula so I can make my way to Calvary. In that 11th chapter of Isaiah, uh, when it talks about this stomp, uh, uh, of Jess and it, it, it growing roots and producing branches. Uh, it goes on to say, and, and, and with it, uh, that there will be the spirit of the Lord. 
and a spirit of wisdom and understanding and a spirit of counsel and might and a spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. That these are the things in which God makes available to each one of us and all of us by first of all having the spirit of the Lord dwell within us and an indwelling. Amen. Amen. Uh, that, that, that we can receive all these things, these same coupled things, this spirit of wisdom and understanding is available to us. This spirit of counsel and might is available unto us. This spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord is available unto us. For you see, God, as we understand, is a triune God. God is three persons and one substance. As referenced in the Nicene Creed, it is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Some has described it that in everything that we see, we see this triune relationship and, 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 and this posture identified. For, for every element of the earth has a liquid, solid, and gas phase. And, 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 and it is God's, I believe, way of saying that, that I am one substance, but yet still three, three persons. And, and, and we see that some have described it as one being. God's authority being God the Father and God the Son being God's compassion and, and, and God the, the Holy Spirit being God's power uh, for, for the Bible reads when Jesus was baptized he went straightway out the water and lo that the heavens were opened up and he saw the Spirit of God descending upon him like a dove and lightning upon him and we heard a voice from heaven saying this is my son in whom I am well pleased we see all three there uh, we see also the Lord declare that the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love uh, 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 of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit. We hear it in the benediction every Sunday before we leave that triune posture. And even in the commission, the great commission, he says, go out ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And even though uh, uh, there are three persons unique and, and, and of one essence and substance, uh, uh, we see the, that, that God's authority rests in the Father, for he is sovereign over all things. And we see God's compassion, which means to suffer with, that God thought it not robbery to, to come down and wrap himself in flesh and dwell amongst us. But then he said, I must go, that, that the advocate and the Holy Spirit might be with you and the Holy Spirit spirit is the power of God for even before God came and dwelled with us as flesh his power moved upon the face of the earth and the dark and helped create everything that it is and the same power that caused all creation to come into being the same power that, that, that moved in the Old Testament that power is available to all who believe You see, the inner dwelling of God, that spirit of the Lord is about the resting power. You know, it's resting, but it yet still is power. It, and power, what, what, what power means is the ability to do. And in this instance, it's the ability to do right. Then it talks about uh, that we receive a spirit of wisdom and a spirit of understanding, a spirit of wisdom and understanding. And that is the ability to determine right matters in judgment. That's wisdom. And the ability to discern right motives, which is an issue of the heart, that's understanding. So we see here that when we receive the spirit of the living God, not only is that an indwelling, but coming with that is an intelligence and interpretation in all that we do. Amen. For 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 wisdom is 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 intelligence in such a way that really we begin to discern things and our ability not only to have wisdom, but to have understanding that we can see motives. Amen. That God will make clear to us what we are dealing with, not only in our own life, but in the lives of others. 
that when we receive the spirit of God, that God gives us that we have access. Amen. To judge things in the right way and to be and have motives revealed unto us before any plans are devised, before we decide to do anything, we need to first understand what's really at stake and what are the motives behind it. But not only that, it says that we also will receive the spirit of counsel and what that simply means is it means that we have the ability to devise the right course. Amen. Amen. For counsel isn't just about reflection. It's really about understanding where you need to go from here. But even when you realize where you need to go from here, you still have to have the ability to deliver the right conclusion. Because how many of us have planned the right course of action, but not had the power to accomplish it? That's why wisdom and understanding were coupled, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, because to have intelligence, amen, without the right interpretation, it can lead you to the wrong place. It's, it's a whole lot of smart people, amen, doing dumb stuff. Come on, preach, thick fan. They, 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 they bright, intelligent, but without the interpretation, the discernment of God that allows you to have the understanding to see whether or not you are doing or in the will of God. And in the same way, there have been instances where people, amen, they have received the right instructions, but don't have the right impact. You got the plan, you know where you need to go from here, but will you allow God to provide you with the power to get it done? Not only does it say a spirit of, of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and a spirit, amen, of, of might, but it also says, amen, that it gives us a spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. For even when we have the intelligence, amen, and we have the right interpretation in the using of that intelligence, even when we know where to go from here and we've had the right course and even the right conclusion, knowledge is the ability to develop the right relationship. Let me, let me walk slowly here. Many times people think knowledge is simply about knowing. But really, knowledge is intimacy between knowing and applying. You know, you haven't learned something simply because you know it. The true sense of learning and knowing is being able to apply that which you have gained the knowledge of. For I can restate to you and I can memorize facts and even the conclusions of equations, but it does me no good if I can't work out no problems. And dare I say, come on, preach thick pen, that an issue that many of us have in our Christian walk, come on, preach thick pen, is that we know the word of God. I heard it. We know the word of God, but are we applying the word of God. You see, knowledge is 
the understanding of not only knowing, but being able to apply it. And that only comes by relationship with God. So it's not only the right relationship between knowing and applying, it's also the right relationship between you and God. But when you know the word of God and the word of God is in your heart, then God will move you to taking that which you know and applying it in your life. So it is the ability to develop right relationship. But finally, as I make my way to the close, it's also the spirit that is not only of knowledge, but the fear of the Lord. And that is the ability to delight in righteous reverence. You see, <clears throat> that next verse, uh, beginning with the third verse, it tells us, and his delight is in the fear of the Lord. For true knowledge begins, come on, with the fear of the Lord. That really applying what we know in the word of God comes from our awe and our reverence of God. And when that we allow God to have influence on us, but also we begin to have influence on others because God is now moving in our hearts and our minds. And God, when God sends us to go, we will begin to have impact in the places that God intended us to have impact first because God is having influence on us. But it's sad to say that we live in a day and age where many really don't have righteous reverence for God. You know that? Come on, preach, thick pen. I'm, I'm, I got two more minutes and I'm gone. There used to be a time that certain stuff people wouldn't do. There were certain stuff people wouldn't do on the church, near the church. I, it was a time when people walked by the church. They, they'd take their hat off walking by the church. It, it, it was a time I remember growing up as a boy, uh, they'd be cussing across the street and drinking and doing all type of stuff. And my mama and us, we would come out in our church clothes. And just because my mama was going to church, they stopped cussing. They asked me, Thick Pen, won't you pray for us when you go? That, that, that was a time that regardless of whether you were in right relationship or not, there was a righteous reverence not only for God, all the things of God, and even the people of God. But we have to wonder, have we lost our influence? But now if we're going to usher in this kingdom of God that is described of by Isaiah, if we are going to live with the king, Christ the king, that, that, that he speaks of in our heart, then what we will do, amen, and all the things that have listened, not only will we have an indwelling of the spirit of God, but we ourselves, because Christ lives in us. Amen. We will have a spirit of wisdom and understanding. We will have a spirit of counsel and might. We will have a spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. You can't expect nobody else to fear the Lord if you act like you don't fear the Lord yourself. But God is telling us through the indwelling of the spirit through the intelligence, interpretation of the spirit, the instruction of the spirit, that not only will we have impact and intimacy, but we also have influence. That we will be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. That we will be the difference makers in this world. Not only will we have the ability to do all things that we desire to do, more important than that, we will be able to do and accomplish the will of God. That we, amen, will be the change makers of this world. We will be the agents and the brokers of difference. We will carry the bloodstained banner. We will usher in God's kingdom here on earth. We will, amen, lift up souls and lives but more importantly lift up the life that mattered most for he says Jesus that if I be lifted up he said if I be lifted up I'll draw all men and women unto me we are living in a dying age in a desperate time where men and women are in need of an inner feeling an inner dwelling of the Holy Spirit of the Lord. But we can't offer Christ to nobody if we hadn't accepted Christ for ourselves. If we haven't accessed the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in us because only by acceptance of Christ as our Lord and access to the power of the Holy Spirit can we then accomplish 
accomplish all these things and more. Not only what you need, not only what you want, but most importantly, all that God has in store for your life. Because I've come here today to tell you that God didn't make you by accident or coincidence. But God had purpose on your life and has promises that he has already waiting for you. And if you walk out this life in obedience to God's word, God will do through you more than you ever imagined. God will do through you. Not your neighbor. You. Your neighbor too, but you. More than you ever could imagine. As we stand all over the...